Good morning, everybody. Happy Sabbath. Start our song service this morning with Crown Him with Many Crowns, page 223. 223. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus and Blessed Spirit, indeed today you are crowned with many crowns. And Lord, as we worship you today, may we crown you the Lord of our life. May we crown you the King of our heart. Thank you, Lord, for drawing us into this place. May we sense your presence, your power, and your grace as we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Congregation may be seated. I would like to thank you for coming here to Piedmont Park, Seventh-day Adventist Church, for worship today. A beautiful fall day outside, and it's a beautiful day to be inside as well, worshiping with all of you. So thank you for choosing Piedmont as your place for worship. As we draw near to the Lord, may you sense His presence and power in your life today. God bless, and happy Sabbath. From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea, creations revealing your majesty. From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring. Uncontainable, you 
place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing, God. All powerful, untamable, and awestruck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim. You are amazing, God. Who has told every lightning bolt where it should go? Or seen heavenly storehouses laden with snow? Who imagined the sun? And gave source to its light Yet conceals it to bring us the coolness of night None can fathom Indescribable, uncontainable You place the stars in the sky And you know them by name You are amazing God. All powerful, untamable, and awestruck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim, you are amazing God. All powerful, untamable. In the depths of my heart, and you love me all the same. You are amazing, God. Well, you see the depths of my heart, and you love me the same. You are amazing. Amen. Thank you, church. It's time for our tithes and offering, but before we do that, I want to first quote a very familiar scripture, and then I want to tell a short testimony about how God helped me with tithes and offering. The scripture is Malachi th chapter 3, verse 10, very familiar, New King James Version, and it says, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing that you will not be able to receive. And I want to let you know God did this in my life. Um, right now, I'm retired and I pay tithe on my gross, that's before the taxes come out. And I've learned through the years that if you pay your tithe, God will also give you an offering. And the, the offering today is for the church budget. I became a Seventh-day Adventist 24 years ago. And when I became a Seventh-day Adventist, I learned after God gives you your 100%, you're supposed to give 10% back. I didn't know that at the time. Before I would pay my bills, and. What I had left over, I gave him a good amount, and I felt that was good enough, and I did it cheerfully. Well, after becoming Seventh-day Adventist and we follow the Bible, I, I was supposed to give 10%. And then I was also told, you know, it's a good idea if you, to put your kids in Christian school. And, wow, that was more than my 10%, and I didn't have money for neither one of them. But, you know, I always trust God, and I always spend time with him and pray. And so what I did at that moment, God, I feel like God showed me what to do. I worked for the federal government, and I wasn't even participating in a pretty good program. It was a retirement program, and you could put in up to 10% of your income in there, and you could, and the government would pay you up to 5% dollar for dollar. Every dollar you put in, it would give you a dollar on 5% of your income, and I wasn't even taking advantage of it. But once I found out there was tithe and, 
in Christian school, the first thing I did, I, I put my money 10% in that, in that um, retirement fund, 401k. And every two years, this is how I pay for my school bill. Every two years, I'd borrow a few thousand from there and, and pay, put some money on my school bill and, and get my finances back in order. And when I borrowed from myself, now everybody has a different testimony. This is what God did for me. When I borrowed from myself, I only had to pay 2%. And in the federal government, you got to pay it back. So once you pay it back, you can borrow again. So every two years, I'd put some money on my school bill. And that my, my youngest daughter was in the third grade at that time. And um, we went to elementary school, high school, and they had some college, three years of college at Union for my oldest daughter. And that's what I did for the for this Christian school. And then on the tithe side, I didn't have the discipline. Now, not that I couldn't manage money because I was in the military and I handled over a million and a half dollars a month paying soldiers. So I can balance money to the T, but with my own budgets, it's a little different. I just do my budget to the, to the, to the penny, but then I'll just, I still do that. I operate generally in it in case I want to give something to somebody or, or spend some. So what I did, since I didn't have the discipline, we were renting. The church I went to the first time, I've been in three churches, Piedmont is the third church. We were renting in this church, and I was helping with the church budget, and I found out I was supposed to give 10%. So I went to the treasurer, and I asked him, where does the church bank? Now, I only had to do this at that church, and I've been in three churches. And he told me, and I told him I wanted to have my money sent to that bank as a direct deposit and have it taken out of my account before I get to it so it would go to the church's account without me knowing the church's account number. And I set that up with the banker, and he, did, he had on there just transfer out, no bank account or anything. And I did that, and after a year, wow, the Seventh-day Adventists uh, uh, let you know how much you give. Before that, I was given in the hundreds. After I became a Seventh-day Adventist, I was given in the thousands because I made $32,000 that first year. So I had given $3,200. I had graduated to the thousands. And I said, oh, Lord, thank you. Wow, look at what, you do, what God does to you when you become a Seventh-day Adventist. Well, after that, I moved to the second church. And it was a large church, two, three, well, 400 members it could hold. And I didn't, I wanted some discipline. I, I, God had shown me what I could do. And, and they didn't know me, but when I first got there, I bought a house out in the country. And in that first church, we drove 45 minutes to Christian school. I moved out in the country, then we drove an hour and a half to Christian school. And buying a house, it was difficult. And that first year, I was back in the hundreds, sorry to say. But I prayed and ga asked God for help to get me back on track. And that's the way I am. If I'm, whether I'm doing good or not, or not, I'm praying all the time when things are going good or whether they go bad. That's just the way God is, and I know he answers prayer. He got me back on track, but I want to tell you how he opened the windows of heaven and poured out a blessing I couldn't receive. In a 10-year period, in just 10 years, God increased, and I mean an increase in salary. He increased my salary by $48,000 in 10 years. You're talking about opening up the windows and pouring out a gift. This is the kind of stuff God does when you try to do things his way. Will the deacons please stand? Heavenly Father, you're such a wonderful God. You know how to give us answers when we don't have answers because you are a wise God. And Lord, we pray that we'll try to do things your way. And Lord, we know you'll help us. So we ask that you bless the funds that are being given today, that they will bring you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just got a few announcements for you as we continue our service. Uh, if this is your first time with us, we want to thank you for coming and hope that it will not be your last time with us. Keep coming back. We'd love to have you as part of our church family. When service is done today, we're going to be having a fellowship meal downstairs, and you're welcome to join us down there and continue our time together. Of course, there's tons of things in the announcements and the bulletin that you can look for. I'm just going to highlight a few of them. Uh, the deacons are going to be meeting here, and it's not just deacons. Anybody who would like to help out, there's going to be a work bee tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. They're going to be spreading around mulch, so if you've got a rake or if you've got a shovel or a wheelbarrow, even if you don't, come and we'll give you one, and you can move some things around and uh, get, the, get the outside of the church looking good for the winter months. 
Uh, I want to let you know that coming up in just a few days, we're going to be having our big outreach event, Light Up the Dark, at Piedmont Park. It's on October 31st, and we've got some deacons here who've got some handouts here. We want to give you a handout for, this is for the Light Up the Dark event so that you can invite your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers to come. It's a free event for anybody to come to. And when they come, they get to go through all our different rooms and see Bible-themed rooms, hear stories about Jesus and the Bible. And they get to have some fun too. And it's all free to anyone who comes. And they walk away being prayed for. And they walk away with our literature as well. So give that to somebody who would like to come for a safe, fun place to learn about Jesus on October 31st. Coming up on November 4th, we're going to have our next soup supper, but I want to make note in the bulletin and uh, so that you know that on that day, our soup suppers normally start at 6. This one's going to start at 5.30 so that we can be done for the next event that's going to be coming, and that is our Pale Horse Rides. We're going to be partnering with Sean Boonstra and the Voice of Prophecy. And yeah, deacons, we're going to give you another chance to walk down. We're going to give the deacons plenty of exercise today. They're going to hand out another handout for you of the Pale Horse Rides. This is an event that you can invite your friends to. It's going to be November 3rd, 4th, and 5th starting at 7 o'clock each night. It'll be done in just an hour, and there's childcare each night so that you can bring the kids as well. And you're going to hear stories of what it was like during the Middle Ages and what the church went through and how it survived some very trying times. You'll hear stories that you don't normally hear. A well-done program by Sean Boonstra. You can come to that. Uh, it's a free for everybody, and it's November 3rd, 4th, and 5th at 7 o'clock. And please invite your friends to be a part of that as well. And now we've got some business to do here, our second readings. We have um, someone transferring out, and that is Cherie Massey-Fisher transferring to Colorado, and Chaz, uh, our former student pastor, is going to be transferring his membership to Guam. And then coming in, we have Thomas and Donna Blackburn coming in from Arkansas. And I think I see Tom, you're back there. Give me a wave there so everybody can say hello to you. Uh, Tom and Donna, we are glad to have them joining with us, transferring in. And we got a couple transferring out. Is there a motion to accept these transfers? I see one there. Is there a second? I see a second there. Okay. All in favor? Can I see those hands? And any opposed? Very good. We will let those membership things go where they need to, but... Tom, we are glad to have you guys a part of our church family here. And now, speaking of family, there is someone having a very special day today. I'd like to have Mason Ponce come up here and join me. And Mason, if you want, go ahead and bring mom and dad too, and they can come along. And maybe even big sister is going to come along, Amelia. All right. And grandma's coming too with the camera. That's good. Come on up here. We got a special family here and a special young guy. Everybody, I want you to say hello to Mason. How you doing, Mason? Are you doing good? We are so thrilled to have you guys here. Hello, Amelia. I see you hiding back there behind mom. <laughs> well, we are thrilled to have the Ponces as a part of our church family. I was uh, thrilled to be able to be a youth pastor for Stephanie years ago and uh, to baptize uh, dad here, Andy. And so just a uh, very thrill for me to be here as a part of this special day. These fine folks are in building and in construction. Stephanie, do you know how many houses you've built or have you lost track at this point? She has lost track. She doesn't know. But out of all the houses you guys build and all the things that you're going to build in life, this is the most important because it's one thing to build a house. And I actually know nothing about building a house, but I do know something about building a home because I've learned it from God. And God gives us some tips about how to build a home. In Proverbs chapter 24, verse 3, it says, By wisdom a home is built, and by understanding it is established. In Psalm 127, it says, Unless the Lord builds the home, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. Now, you guys are going to teach Mason some awesome things in life. You're going to maybe show him how to use a hammer. You're going to show him how to, how to paint, maybe how to lay carpet, all those wonderful things. And you're going to teach him other things too, how to read, how to, how to do math. But one of the best things you guys can do is teach him about his Savior, teach him about Jesus. And God speaks about this in Deuteronomy. 
Speaking of God's Word, it says, Therefore, you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. So that's what I want to challenge you guys with today. Of all the things that you'll teach this special little man, he's been entrusted to you by God. And now the challenge I have for you, and the reason that you're here is to dedicate your lives so that Mason will learn about Jesus. Not just in what you say, but just as he watches you, as he sees the two of you love each other, he'll learn more about Jesus. And so we're going to have a special prayer for Mason at this time. If there are family members that want to stand at this time, or those who are especially connected to Mason, you guys can do that. And I'd like to invite the church family to pray. And he looked like he wanted to come to me, so I'm going to give that a, a whirl. We'll just turn so we can keep a look at, on Mommy and make sure she doesn't do anything wild during the prayer, okay? All right. So let's pray for Mason here. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the gift of children. What an amazing gift it is, Lord, because these little ones teach us about you. And so we thank you for Mason. We thank you for how you blessed the Ponce family. May you help this little boy to grow up, to become the man that you want him to be. And Lord, may you bless Andy and Stephanie and little Amelia as well. Bless their home, Lord, that it may be a place where you are always present. And Lord, we put Mason in your hands. Guard him and thank you for loving him. We put him in your hands that you may care for him and help him to become who you want him to be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, Mason, thank you so much for coming up here. Thanks for hanging out with me for a little bit. Should we do this again sometime? Maybe next time I'll give you the microphone. We'll let you preach, okay? <laughs> he looks like he's ready to, folks. Oh, before you guys leave, I have a little card here showing that this was his dedication day, and we are so thankful to have you guys with us. Make sure you give this wonderful family a, a hug or a high five or a fist bump and tell them how blessed we are to have them as part of our church. Thank you, guys. God bless you. Let's continue our worship now with some songs of worship. I'd like to invite you to stand as we sing, Pass Me Not.
this next song, 671, as we come to you in prayer. And afterwards, please kneel as far as possible. Father, we come to you in prayer this morning. We come to you to worship, to hear your words spoken to us, to sing our praises. Father, may our praise and our worship be acceptable in your sight today. Lord, we pray for your Holy Spirit to surround us, to cast the cares of the world away, that we may concentrate that we may focus on your love and your care for each one of us. Father, I'm so thankful for our church family who focuses so much on our children. Lord, I pray for the light of the dark that's coming in just over a week where children from our whole community can come and hear about Jesus. There's nothing better that they could learn about on Halloween than Jesus. We thank you for this opportunity that we have to open our doors, and we pray for your blessing upon it. Lord, I want to thank you for little Mason this morning and for his mom and dad and his sister. But I also want to thank you for all the moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas here who help our children learn about Jesus. Oh, what a joy to know Jesus, that they could grow up to trust you, to love you. Father, I just want to thank you this morning that you gave your son for us. Forgive us for what we've done wrong. Heal our sins. Heal our diseases. Open our minds to understand you, to love you more. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Sabbath, church family. I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version, and I'm going to be reading Ezekiel 10, 18, and 19. Then the glory of the Lord departed from the threshold of the temple and stood over the cherubim. And the cherubim lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight. When they went out, the wheels were beside them, and they stood at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house, and the glory of the God of Israel was above them. May the Lord bless the reading of his holy word. Amen. Thank you so much, Joanne, for reading God's word, and Cindy for a beautiful prayer this morning, and for everyone who has helped with our service today. I was five years old when everything changed. In the first five years of my life, innocence reigned. That was me. 
life was good. Any shows that I watched, the good guys always prevailed. Good always won. But in 1980, everything changed. My parents took me to see a new movie that was coming out. In 1980, they took me to see the new Star Wars movie, The Empire Strikes Back. And I will try to avoid any specific spoilers in the sermon, but it has been a while, so. But when I got done with that movie, I left the movie thinking, did, did the bad guys win? Is, is that even possible? Bad guys don't win, do they? And, and good guys can't lose, can they? You see, prior to that, I had never dreamed that a bad guy could actually win. What happens in our life when it looks like evil is winning? And how do we have faith in God when we're stuck with that question in our life of why? Why is this happening? How do we have faith in God when it looks like the empire has won? Well, this week we're going to try to answer that question. By continuing our sermon series, we've been looking at the history that we find in the Bible, and we're going to look back into a time of salvation history when God's people began to wonder if God was done with them. When they were sent into captivity, when they lost their home, they had to figure out the answer to the question, can we still have faith in God when we're defeated, when it looks like evil is won? And then hopefully we can ask that question of ourselves, what will our faith look like if we go into captivity? Well, Ezekiel is one of the books of Scripture that tells us about the captivity. And if you want to turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel, that's where we're going to be hanging out today. Ezekiel, and you can open up your Bible if you've got it that opens. If it doesn't open, well, then open up the app electronically and make sure you're following along. But Ezekiel is a unique book in the Bible, to say the least. It's full of amazing visions. We see cherubim, angels like we've never seen before. We have these prophecies that are given to Ezekiel, and they're given to warn God's people. Ezekiel's vision also reveals to us why Israel went into captivity. So Ezekiel's story takes place after Jerusalem has fallen. It's been defeated. He's one of the exiles that's taken from his home and removed as an exile to Babylon. So Israel is defeated. They've been brought low. They're in captivity in a foreign land. Could you imagine what that would have been like to lose your home? Questions plague God's people since for all practical purposes, it had looked like evil had won. And so now as they make that long, lonely trek across the wilderness to Babylon, and it takes on foot about five months to get there, to never see their home again. They're asking these questions. Why did this happen? Are we still God's people? Was God defeated? Did, did God get defeated? And then the biggest question, is there any hope? These are the questions that God seeks to answer through Ezekiel's ministry. So we begin in Ezekiel chapter 1. So if you have your Bible, open it up to Ezekiel chapter 1. The prophet sees this mighty storm happening as he's there in Babylon by the river. And in the storm, he sees something amazing. And he's trying to describe it, and it's hard to even fathom it, what he sees. But he sees this amazing vision of God on his throne. Ezekiel chapter 1, if you look with me at verse 28 said it was like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day, so the appearance of the brightness all around it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. From the very first chapter, the vision we see is God in His glory. So it certainly doesn't look like God's been defeated. Now, you might say, well, why was that ever even a concern? Of course, of course God can't be defeated. Well, you might know that today sitting here in Lincoln, but they didn't know that back then. 
See, in ancient times, people believed that whatever happened here on earth also happened up in the realm of the gods. So that means if Babylon comes and defeats Jerusalem and takes its people captive, well, then obviously that must mean in their minds that the Babylonian gods in the realms where the gods lived must have come along and beat up and defeated the Hebrew god. So that's what they thought. So God begins this amazing book in the Bible by showing His glory to Ezekiel, by answering the question that God has not nor ever will be defeated. But that leads us to another question. What is God doing in Babylon? Because that's where Ezekiel's at. He's in Babylon, a long ways away from Jerusalem. What's God doing there? And again, we may not be very vexed by that because we think of God as God of all the earth, right? And God is everywhere. He, he's down there with you as much as He's up here with me, right? He's out there in the foyer as much as He is with us here. God's everywhere. That's not what they viewed before. Back then, they thought that all gods were kind of territorial, and they kind of hung out in their own territories, kind of like sports teams. Everybody around here cheers for this team. That's kind of how they viewed their gods. And so if you left an area, you left that influence of that god. He just kind of had to stay within his natural, national boundaries. And so now they're wondering, what? Ezekiel's got to be asking the question, how is God here in Babylon? God's the, yeah, not the Lord of Babylon. This is where Bel, this is where Marduk rule. How can the Lord God of Judah be here in Babylon? And this is answered as we study the major question of why the captivity happened. So if you've got your Bible, open it up to Ezekiel chapter 8, and we're going to find out just why God sent His people away into exile. In Ezekiel 8, we're not going to read the whole chapter today, uh, but you can do that this afternoon or throughout the week. God shows the prophet Ezekiel the abominations of things that are happening in His temple. And remember, the temple was where God's glory is supposed to be, right? It's supposed to be there at the temple. Let's look and see what's happening there. Ezekiel chapter 8, starting in verse 3, it says, God, He reached out in the form of a hand and took me by the lock of the hair, and the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and heaven and brought me in visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the north gate of the inner court, where the, the seat of the image of jealousy was which provokes jealousy. And behold, the glory of God was there, like the visions that I had seen on the plain. He says, I, I see God's glory there just like I saw on the plain. And here, right in the courtyard, was an image of jealousy. They had built a statue to another god right in God's temple courtyard. And then God says, that ain't all. It gets worse. Down to verse 12 says that they are worshiping images and idols of animals as happening. Ezekiel sees that in verse 12. In verse 14, he finds women, and they're worshiping the goddess Tammuz, which was a pagan god, until finally gets to verse 16 in the very inner court of the temple, and Ezekiel sees in vision people worshiping the sun there. God had actually built the temple so that when and the sanctuary so that when you came into the sanctuary, you came in facing west. Okay, this is west, right? Yeah. Facing west, you turned your back on the east, turned your back on the sun. But they had turned and they were now worshiping the sun right there in God's temple. They had turned their back on God. So this answers the question of why Israel was sent to captivity. It was because of their unfaithfulness. In verse 17, chapter 8, verse 17, God asked the question. And He said to me, Have you seen this, O son of man? Is this a trivial thing to the house of Judah to commit the abominations which they commit here? They have filled the land with violence, and they have returned to provoke me to anger. He says, Is this a trivial thing? Well, what do you think? The stuff that Israel was doing, was it trivial? Did it matter? Yes, it mattered greatly. 
And the question there brings the implication of, of course, no, this is not trivial. This is horrible. It's disgusting. They're worshiping other gods. He says, violence and injustice has filled the land. So God says, I have to act. There are times when God has to work like an emergency room doctor. There are times when God has to do something drastic to stop what's happening and to help Judah and Israel. Surgery is a drastic event, is it not? Anybody who's been through surgery will admit you're very thankful to see the anesthesiologist before the surgery happens, right? Surgery is a drastic thing, but sometimes ripping a chest cavity open is the only way to save a life. Sometimes God has to go to emergency means in order to save, and He does that in the Bible and in our lives too. In Ezekiel chapter 10, we see something happening as He's shown Ezekiel what's happening in the temple. Then in Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 18, our Scripture text for the day says, Then the glory of the Lord, what's the next word? Departed. Departed from the threshold of the temple and stood over the cherubim. And then it goes in the next verse to the east gate. God's presence leaves the temple and begins to head to the east. And then the next chapter, Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 23, it says, And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood on the mountain, which is on the east side of the city. So God's glory now has been moving, and now it gets up and it moves again, and it stops the Mount of Olives on the east side of the city. Perhaps God is maybe looking back, one last look, on what was supposed to be Jerusalem, the city of peace, on what was supposed to be the promised land. And Ezekiel tells us that God's glory leaves Jerusalem and heads west to Babylon. This actually answers the question of if they were still God's people. Are we, are we still God's people, though we've been cast out, though we're off in exile? What Ezekiel lets them know is that God's glory and His presence is leaving the temple, and that reveals that He still cares for them because God goes with His people into exile. Amen? This is why Ezekiel can see God's throne when he's in Babylon. In that original vision in chapter 1, God was revealing to His people, I'm not bound by territory. God is the God of the entire earth, and He's not defeated, though Israel was defeated. And God goes with His people, even when they go into captivity. So the book of Ezekiel shows us that even though Jerusalem was defeated, even though they'd go into captivity, Evil did not win. Evil did not defeat God. But one question remains for them. Now that they're living, they're displaced, they are refugees, they're exiles in another land. One question remains. Is there any hope? We know God wasn't defeated. We, we, I guess we're still His people. We know now why it happened because of our unfaithfulness. But is there any hope or is this the end? Will we ever go back? Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 16. And it reads, Thus says the Lord God, Although I have cast them far off among the Gentiles, and although I have scattered them among the countries, yet I shall be a little sanctuary for them in the countries where they have gone. God says, I'm still going to be a sanctuary for them. I'm not going to leave them destitute. I will be a sanctuary with them even in exile. Before God's glory leaves, He promises to return a remnant to Israel. That's the very next verse, verse chapter 11, verse 17. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples, assemble you from the countries where you've been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. Like Jeremiah, God promises again here in Ezekiel that they will someday return. Captivity will not last forever, and the empire did not win. And now one of the most beautiful promises in all the Bible is in Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 18 and 19. 
verse 18 says, and they will go there, and they will take away its detestable things and all its abominations from there, and then I will give them one heart, and I'll put a new spirit within them and take away the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. God promises to give His people a new heart. Did you know God was the first one who ever did a heart transplant? Yeah, it wasn't us. We figured it out a long time ago. But God figured it out even longer how to do this amazing thing with hearts. And He says, I'm going to give you a heart transplant. I'm not just going to change your heart. I'm not just going to tweak it. I'm not just going to do a little thing here and there. I'm going to give you a brand new one. Do you need a new heart? Yeah. Why does God give His people a new heart? Verse 20, so that they may walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. God changes His people, and He does it from the inside out so that we can obey Him. And then He says, then I can be your God. Because the major theme of the Bible is simply all throughout the Bible, it's God saying over and over again, like it's His theme song that He keeps singing to you and me. It's just God saying, I want to be with you. And He sings it from the first notes in Genesis all the way to the closing chord in Revelation. And He even sings that song in the story of the exile. I will be with you. But now today you say, what does all this mean for us, Pastor? We're not in exile. We're not in captivity. And if we're honest, you don't know how it feels. And I don't know how it feels. Most of us today don't know what it's like. We can't relate to captivity, can we? We've mostly lived our lives where we were born. We might have moved here or there, but we didn't get torn apart and taken to captivity. So we don't know what it was like to have our city destroyed, to picture Lincoln in ruins, being burned. We've never experienced that. We've been taken to exile. We've never lost family and friends in a war like this. We haven't experienced this. But my friends, we all go through captivity in some form or another. And when we do, we all ask those tough questions again about God and we ask them at some point in our lives. Some of us will struggle with the captivity of losing a job. Where are you, God? Some of us will face the captivity of heartbreak from a lost relationship. Why did you let this happen, God? Others will face the captivity of loneliness. Can you still hear me, God? Or the captivity of addiction or the captivity of sickness. Is there any hope, God? And at some point or another in life, or maybe you're in it right now, captivity comes our way. And Ezekiel answers the question, how will we walk with God when we're in captivity? What will your relationship with God look like when you go through your captivity? Will you continue to be able to stand and trust? when captivity comes your way. It was a lifetime of waiting. I felt like it would never arrive. Three years I waited. And when you're six years old, three years is half your life, right? Three long years I waited to find out if indeed the empire was going to win. Would good be completely stamped out in the Star Wars universe? Would the heroes be defeated? Would evil win? And I had to wait until the next Star Wars movie came out, and the title alone brought hope. For the title of the next movie was called The Return of the Jedi. And again, I'm not going to put any spoilers here, but it has been out a few years. So... You see, the answer to the empire or evil's seeming control and power was answered by a return. And that's the story of the Bible, too. When we're in captivity, 
when it looks like hope is lost, God's Word reminds us, I am still with you, even in hard times, even in your captivity. And God promised that He would return a remnant and bring them back to their homeland. And God gives us His Word to assure us that at the end of the captivity in this world, at the end of the captivity of sin, no matter how long we've waited, no matter how long we've been in captivity, a return is still coming. Amen? Amen. So in our darkest moments, when we cry out, is there any hope? In the book of Revelation, just like in Ezekiel, and just like for George Lucas, the only answer, the only hope is a return. Only in Revelation, it's not the return of the remnant of God's people that brings the victory, that brings the end of captivity of sin. And it's certainly not the return of any Jedi that's going to end the reign of evil. But it is a return because it's the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the sacrificed lamb, the roaring lion who will return to end sin and all its captivity no matter what captivity you may be in right now, no matter what captivity or evil may throw at us in the future, God's Word still stands true. And it declares to me and you, God saying, I will be with you. And it stands true as it declares that Jesus the King is returning to end evil's reign to end sin's captivity forever. This book tells you, even at your darkest moment, there is and always will be hope. For the empire of sin has not and will not win because the King is returning. Dear Father in heaven, Wonderful Lord Jesus and blessed Spirit, thank you for recording in your word even the tough things, the hardships that your people went through. Because of their mistakes, they went into captivity, Lord. And thank you, Lord, for teaching us that even when we make mistakes, even when we turn from you, you're still there. Your glory still comes after us, longing for a relationship with us. So, Lord, when we find ourselves far away from you or far away from home, may we remember that we cannot escape your presence and your glory. You're there always with your arms outreached, waiting for us to come back. And, Lord, may we stand firm in the foundation that your word has given us, that captivity of sin will not last forever and one day soon. You're coming soon to put an end to sin and captivity. We long for that day, Lord, but until it comes, help us to trust you and to stand firm today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we close our service today, would you stand as we sing about our God and our firm foundation? Page 509, first, fourth, and fifth verse.
thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can claim that amazing promise that the soul, though all hell, should endeavor to shake, you will never, never, no, never, never forsake. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that we can stand on this foundation, on this truth. Now, Lord, as we leave this place, there are so many others in this world that need to know about your return. There are so many others in this world who are involved in sin's captivity and need to be broken free by Jesus. Only, Lord, you're not sending angels to do that work alone. You're sending us into this world to tell them that there is freedom of captivity and there is hope. So help us to go forth from this place, Lord, inspired by your word and emboldened to tell the world that there is hope in Jesus. And all those willing to share about Jesus said, amen. In Jesus' name, God bless each and every one of you. Have a great day, a wonderful week, and a happy Sabbath.